please pray with me from the psalm. Let the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. God's grace, his mercy, and his peace to you, dear brothers and sisters, in Jesus' holy name. Amen. Today, in the reading of the Holy Gospel, we see a particular Jesus that often we don't want to or like to see. We see a side of him that perhaps we're not used to, even though we're used to reading the Holy Scriptures, and this account is very familiar to us. We are probably a bit uncomfortable with it. For today, Jesus in the text of the Gospel is not the Christmas baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger, but a man who is overturning tables and scattering money. Today, Jesus is not the epiphany Jesus who dines with the tax collectors and sinners, loves the wayward disciples, and warmly touches the untouchable lepers. But he is chasing men and animals out of the temple. Today, he's not the Jesus that's on the receiving end of the whip. He is rather the Jesus on the giving end of the whip. Even so, as we consider Jesus in this text, he is no different Jesus. He is not Jesus acting out of character. This is Jesus still living, still loving, and same as always, in love and compassion. Jesus living in love for his bride, the church. Living with a love that cannot stand idly by, but must take action. A love that in its zeal is consuming. A love that he has for his Father in heaven. A love that he has for you. John and the other disciples remember the psalmist and the psalm which spoke of this. Zeal for your house has consumed me. But realize that it wasn't the physical house, the temple building itself, that was so important. God has been satisfied with a traveling tent, the tabernacle, for his house, and he never asked for another one to be built. Rather, it was what took place in the house, what took place in the temple that was so important. It was the place of the shedding of blood, it was the place where God and man were reconciled. It was the place where sin was dealt with and forgiveness of God was given. A place of faith, faith in the promises of the living God. A place where God gifted his people and gifted his people with himself. But that's exactly what wasn't being taken seriously anymore in the temple. That was the problem in the midst of the temple. Things in the temple had been turned upside down long before Jesus got there that day. For God's house, which was supposed to be a house of prayer, a house of faith, a house of forgiveness, a house of holiness, had been turned upside down as a house of trade. Oh, it had probably all started out with good intentions, with good in mind, providing the sacrificial animals for those who were traveling, the traveling pilgrims who had come such a long way and couldn't bring all these sacrificial animals with them. But it had now taken on, in the first century, a life of its own and turned into doing the right thing for the wrong reasons. Christ's bride, the church, his people, weren't being taken care of anymore. Forgiveness had been turned into a business, and God's love and grace had been reduced to a simple business transaction. Now, there is a more important truth it would be well for every one of us to learn and remember from what developed in the temple in Jesus' day, that what you do affects what you believe. What you do 
affects what you believe. Or to put it in the more theological way, doctrine, the Holy Scriptures, the Word of the Living God, what you believe and what you practice, what you do, go together. So when you start conducting business in the temple as a practice, you soon to begin to think of God in business terms, your doctrine. When you start buying animals, you may soon start to think in terms of buying forgiveness. And while everything on the surface may look good and right and outstanding and upstanding on the outside, what you do on the inside, in the heart, what you believe, everything becomes wrong. That danger is still very present for us today as well. Very real for us today in the church and in our lives. It is very dangerous to think that I can, however I want and as long as I want to live the way I want to live, how I want to live, and believe the right thing, and then it's okay. Because if you live as if God did not matter, and if you mattered the most, you know what will begin to happen, don't you? Pretty soon, God will not matter at all. If you live as if the people around you don't matter, pretty soon, they won't. What we do affects what we believe. That's why the church has always been careful with her liturgy and her practices. From the first century, from the ascension of Jesus on, the church has always been careful with her liturgy and her practice. What we do here, what we do here affects what we believe in here, in our hearts. Make no mistake about it. And the opposite is true also. What we believe will affect what we do. Because what lives in your head and what lives in your heart will work itself out in your actions. Our liturgy and our lives not only affect what we believe, they also reflect what we believe. And so if we believe that Jesus Christ is truly present here in this house, let me say it again, if we truly believe that Jesus Christ is truly present here in this house, we will act like it. And if Christ matters to us in our lives, we will live like it. But when you take a look at your own life and take a good look into your own heart, what do you see? What does your self-examination show? Oh no, maybe you and I have not been selling animals in the temple lately. But have we been bargaining with God in different ways? Confessing one truth, but living another? Negotiating with God to try to hang on to some of our pet sins? Trying to deal with God by doing some good deeds here in attempts to make up for the bad ones over here? Do we perhaps try to manage our relationship with God instead of letting God's love have his way with us? So maybe we all need a little Lenten turning over of the tables in our hearts and driving out of the beasts of sin that have settled in and made themselves at home in us. Yes, we need the love and the compassion of a God that will not let us go our own way, that will not let us stay in our sin and die. We need the love and compassion of a God that gives the law, the Ten Commandments, to reveal the stench of our sin in order to cleanse the tainted temples of our hearts. We need the love and compassion of a God that cuts in order to heal that kills in order to make alive. We need the love and compassion of a God that caused God to send His one and only Son into our sin-filled world. We need the love and compassion of a God that consumes Jesus with zeal for His temple, 
because he is consumed with zeal for you. We need the love and compassion of a God that will drive us to repentance. And thank the Lord, thank the Lord we have such a God. A God who is completely consumed with you, with your forgiveness, with your reconciliation to Him, who cares about everything, even the smallest details of your life, who cares about how you live, who cares about the things you do, who cares when He sees you wandering away, who cares when He sees you hurting yourself in the very things that might seem harmless to you, who cares so much. And maybe, in the opinion of some, cares too much. Like when he steps in to do something about it. But it is that very stepping in that not only works in our hearts and lives to drive us to repentance, but that provided for us a new temple. A new temple that has taken the place of the old one. A new temple that is not anchored in Jerusalem. A new place where God dwells with his people in human flesh and blood. And so a new place where God and man are brought back together again. Where God and man are reconciled. Where forgiveness takes place. The new temple of Jesus the new temple of which Jesus spoke. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. And that new temple was provided. For that dwelling of God, destroyed on the cross, was raised up three days later. Which means that while other temples, especially the old stone temple, is long gone, the new flesh and bone temple of Jesus is still with us. And it will always be with us. It will always, with compassion and love, be with us to care, to forgive, to teach, to lead, to heal, to speak, to cleanse, to wash, to feed, here to care for his bride, the Holy Church, still con completely consumed by love for you. That is the Jesus that walked into the temple that Passover in Jerusalem. The Lamb of God who rendered all other sacrificial lambs obsolete. The one on whom the whip of hate and scorn lashed down. The one who redeemed us not with gold and silver, but with his holy precious blood and with his innocent suffering and death. And so the one consumed with us is consumed by our sin on the cross. And yet he is not consumed, but is risen and now lives to give forgiveness. And the one consumed with us is consumed by our death, in his death. And yet he is not consumed, but risen, and now gives to us life. And the one consumed with us is now consumed by us. He is now consumed by us as he gives here his very body and blood to eat and to drink for the forgiveness of your sins. But yet he is not consumed, but is risen, and now lives in us. His life into our life, and our life into his. And to one end, and to one end, that we might live with him forever. That as he dwells with us here in our home, we too might dwell with him there in his home. And that, brothers and sisters in Christ, that was always the plan. Always the plan. That when the new temple came to Jerusalem, when that new temple walked into Jerusalem, the old temple would pass away. That's exactly why St. Paul wrote in the reading of our epistle today, 
We preach Christ, and we preach Christ crucified. Not a God that we can deal with or manage. Not a God who puts up with us. Not a God who is content to let us go our own way, the way we want, to define our own truth. Not a God who just winks at our indiscretions and sins, or who wants to cut us a little slack. No, not that kind of God at all. But a God who cares. A God who put his love into action. And a God who still does. A God who came to cleanse us from our sin and redeem us as his own. For he is a God who could not stand idly by, and he still cannot. But in love and in compassion comes to us that you, that you now be his temple. His temple cleansed in forgiveness his temple raised to a new life, his temple in which and through which he lives and works for the life of the world. May God continue to bestow upon us such grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God, which surpasses all human comprehension, guard and protect our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. Please stand. And with me, confess.